And we begin tonight with just 69 days to go until Election Day. And Democrats have Georgia on their minds. Today, Vice President Kamala Harris and Governor Tim Walz kicked off a bus tour through the southern part of the state, starting with a visit to a high school where the VP spoke with the marching band. Your generation, all that you guys stand for, everything you have at stake is what is going to propel our country into the next era of what we can do and what we can be. You are showing what hard work can achieve, what discipline can achieve, what teamwork can achieve. And that's the stuff of great leadership. Donald Trump could never. They also met with voters at a barbecue restaurant in the city of Savannah. That is where Harris will be holding a solo rally tomorrow. Now, Vice President Harris is no stranger to the Peach State. She's visited Georgia seven times this year alone. And, of course, held that rally earlier this month in Atlanta featuring Megan the Stallion. But this trip is different because the areas that VP Harris and Governor Waltz are visiting are spots that Democratic candidates typically ignore. In fact, the last time a Democratic nominee spent significant time campaigning in southern Georgia, it was Bill Clinton in 1992. This is part of a larger strategy from the harris waltz campaign. They are recognizing that in order to win this critical battleground state in November, they can't just rally Metro Atlanta's bluest counties to turn out. They also have to court voters in suburban and rural communities to make inroads, however small, in Republican strongholds. One of Harris's top deputies told the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, quote, these are the types of places where you might not be able to go from losing 90-10, or you might not be able to go from losing 90-10 to winning them, but you can absolutely stave off a bigger defeat. And in Georgia, where President Biden won by just under 12,000 votes in 2020, every vote clearly matters. This is the state where Donald Trump remains under criminal indictment for his efforts to overturn that win, including asking the Secretary of State to commit a literal felony while they were both being recorded. It's also a state where three pro-Trump members of Georgia's state election board are now actively adopting new certification rules that officials in both parties warn could soon could sow misinformation and cause chaos in November. And joining me now is Jelani Cobb, dean of Columbia University School of Journalism and MSNBC contributor, Latasha Brown, co-founder of the Black Voters Matter Fund and the Southern Black Girls and Women's Consortium. Former Senator Doug Jones, he's currently a distinguished senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. And Paul Rykoff, founder and CEO of Independent Veterans of America. Thank you all for being here. Tasha, I do want to go to you first. I, it's kind of a tale of two stories in the state of Georgia. The voter registration numbers in Georgia are huge, but voter registration writ large, 175% increase in black women 18 to 29. Hispanic women 18 to 29, 149.7% increase in voter registrations across the states. Black women in general, 98.4. Black Americans, 85.8. And women in general, 18 to 29, 83.7 percent. So you're seeing in and out of Georgia just phenomenally historic voter registration increases. But then in Georgia, you also have this headline. Pro-Trump Georgia officials, they wrote new rules to deny election results. They have uh, emails, emails show a Georgia state election board member worked with Trump supporters to write rules allowing counties to refuse and certify election results. So as somebody who does this thing for a living, getting voters to register and getting them to turn out, are you more up on the idea that so many more people are registered or concerned that Republicans are determined to stop them from actually voting or just steal the election? Let me say this. I am cautiously optimistic. What I believe is that Georgia is absolutely in play, that what we're seeing when we're seeing these numbers of voter registration, high voter registration with women, that means that the opportunity and the momentum is there, is a matter of mobilization, but it's not just around the vote. What we knew, the way that I see it is kind of like three phases. There's a phase around protecting and making sure that people get out and mobilize the vote, but there's also, we've got to make sure that we protect that vote, because I do believe that there's a strategy from Trump, part of the reason why I think that he has not been campaigning really hard is because I think that there's an attempt that he has, that he wants to literally try to in, um, infuse this, this idea of doubt in the process around who voted and this certification process. This month alone, there have been two new laws passed in Georgia that essentially make the Republicans give them power and empowers them 
that if they don't like the results, they can actually challenge the certification and it can all draw, draw, draw it out to expand so that on election night, if it's a close election, there's problems. And so I think that is why it's really important about what, Pres what Vice President Kamala Harris is doing right now to go out in rural areas so you can actually impact and shave off that vote. We saw the same thing happen in the Biden election. The part of in the Biden election, when you look at while many of those Republican counties did not flip to become Democratic counties, what you saw is you saw that shade of difference in those counties that the Republicans did not just sweep those counties. And ultimately, it led to the outcome that we saw where Biden won the state of Georgia. Yeah, and Jelani, I mean, the way that we talk about rural communities is that we sort of paint them white, right? But rural communities are very diverse. There are Latino sure. people, voters out there. There are black voters out there. There are Asian Americans. Out there. Like, there are a lot of people who live in rural America who people don't think about. So how should we be thinking about this? Because this is a combination of an excitement election, but also still Georgia is one of the most suppressive states in the country. So listen, you know, here's you know, what's key and why, you know, the work that Latasha uh, has been doing is so important. You know, if you wanted to understand Georgia politics, and, you know, I lived in Georgia for 12 years. If you wanted to understand Georgia politics uh, kind of in a microcosm, it would be these exact dynamics. As people became increasingly aware that, this, that there was this slumbering colossus of black voters that are in these rural counties, that when you combine them with the metro Atlanta uh, you know, populations uh, and those suburban populations could actually peel the state back into the blue column, uh, which we saw in 2020, as people began enacting a strategy to make that happen, that explains the dynamics you saw around voter suppression in the state of Georgia. Uh, around the uh, controversies in the Governor Brian Kemp's uh, earlier, going all the way back to 2018, uh, when he got into trouble for holding up 53,000 uh, registered votes, uh, most of whom were African American. That's why the law was passed in order to make it more difficult to give people water uh, if, you, if you were in line to vote. All of these things were meant to counteract the fact that there was this demographic reality that, that could actually make Georgia a blue state. Yeah. And I mean, Doug Jones, yeah, you have having done this yourself in the state of Alabama, you know, winning in these southern states, it's a combination of maxing out. There's always one big blue city in every red state. Every red state's got a blue city. Even Utah's got one. Salt Lake City. And, you know, they've, got, they've all got one. But then it's, it's it is about eating into some of those rural numbers. Right. And, and assess how you think that Harris and Walls are strategizing in terms of getting at least some traction in the rural parts of the state. Yeah, you know, Joy, I, I completely agree with you uh, that you've got to you've got to narrow the gap. That's what I see in these rural areas. They're going to lose a lot of these counties. They're going to lose the counties they probably went into today. But if you don't lose them as big, if you can peel off yeah. not just minority voters, but you can peel off white voters, right, white voters, you remember, at one point were all in for Democrats because we, Democrats gave them roads, Democrats gave them electricity, de Democrats gave them Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. So I think there's a, a, an argument to be made that the message that we're pu uh, putting out there right now, especially with Tim Walls, who can relate to those rural white voters a lot, I think we can narrow those gaps. I think it's a, a wonderful strategy. I think it's a strategy that can not only win Georgia and flip Georgia, but it's a strategy that if we can continue this pattern over the next cycles, we can make some serious inroads in the South. Uh, Paul Rocker, let me get you in here, because one of the strategies that the Trump administration uses, he does appeal to sort of his traditional base, which has tended to include military <coughs> veterans, military folks. Uh, he went to Arlington National Cemetery, which is a, an iconic, uh, very important place in the United States for anyone connected in any way to the United States military or just reveres them. And he was invited by one family to come out and be a part of this wreath laying ceremony. It's supposed to be a solemn event. Uh, there's a whole controversy now. NPR first reported it, that there was a confrontation between between Donald Trump's team and the folks at Arlington, because you are not allowed to use Arlington for political purposes. You're not supposed to photograph in certain areas where they are sacred and there and they, and there were human beings buried there. You're not supposed to use them as props. He did so anyway. We can post some of the things that he posted on his social media. He posted some videos that look like, you know, they were shot there and that the purpose of being there was to make these videos for himself, which you're not allowed to do. Talk a little bit about that controversy, um, because it doesn't feel like an authentic way to get uh, folks in the military, because Donald Trump has said some pretty nasty things about veterans. It's a real issue. 
And, and I think most importantly, because the rules are very clear. You're not supposed to use Arlington National Cemetery for a political photo op. And the controversy right now is not between Trump and some liberal group or between MSNBC. It's Trump and Arlington National Cemetery. They've actually put out an official statement saying, here are the rules. This is why we have the rules. And Trump broke the rules, because you're not supposed to create content. You're not supposed to make TikTok videos. It's not Disney World. You don't go down there to make a selfie. It's the most sacred place in our country, and it should be treated as such. That's why candidates don't use it as a campaign stop. So he clearly crossed the line and broke the rules. It's also bad taste. I mean, to have a photo of him with a thumbs up and a smile over the, the grave of, of a Marine is inappropriate. It's, it's disgraceful. And I don't think it's going to help him with independent voters. And I think that's this pattern that you've seen where he continues to make mistakes. He insulted Medal of Honor recipients. He attacked John McCain. We know that narrative, but it is stacking up and it hurts him in places like Georgia with independent voters. 50% of veterans are independent. Almost half the country is independent and they care about veterans issues. They care about national security. And if you can focus on that and question Trump's patriotism, as I think Vice President Harris very effectively did in the convention, you can move people because they're sounding like a more moderate Democratic Party, especially coming out of the DNC. And you backstop that with a campaign uh, with Tim Waltz out in front, who's a coach who, who served in the National Guard, and you can really make some headway. I served uh, in, in the Army at, in Georgia. I was at Fort Stewart. I was at Fort Benning. I know Georgia. And I think t you know, Tim Waltz gives you the ability to walk into a VFW hall, to walk into a military base and get people to pay attention where they otherwise would never listen to Democrats. And if you can peel off those people, you can make some significant gains. J.D. Vance is the single strangest Republican candidate for vice president in history, including Spiro Agnew, who ultimately uh, pleaded guilty to tax evasion for all the bribes that he took and had to resign from the vice presidency. J.D. Vance has said that single women who do not, have, or, or any women, married women, who do not have biological children, disorient and really disturb him. And he does not want them to be teachers. All of my elementary school teachers were women who did not have children. They were all in the Catholic order of the Sisters of St. Joseph. They taught me to read and write. J.D. Vance has been a Catholic for about five years, so he may never have met a nun. He certainly was never taught by a nun. But he is willing to condemn them because he is so profoundly weird, as Tim Wallace would put it. The Republican candidates for president and vice president used to both be named Donald. Now only one of them is. James Donald Bowman is the name on J.D. Vance's birth certificate. His mother changed his name when she remarried and didn't just change his last name, she changed his middle name to David. He then went through life as James David Hamill. Went to college under that name, went to law school under that name. Before he got married, he changed his last name to Vance, which is his grandmother's last name. Using the initials J.D. just might be his way of eliminating his own personal confusion over whether his name should be James Donald or James David. And James David Vance's name changes could be an enlightening experience for him. Perhaps J.D. Vance has insights earned the hard way about kids struggling with their identities. J.D. Vance's history of name changes could mean that he is now someone who really knows who he is because, unlike most of us, he actually named himself in his final name change. Or perhaps his three different names over time have created a discomfort in him, a discomfort with himself that sometimes could leave him disconnected from other people. And if that's the case, that means that the Republican candidate for president and the Republican candidate for vice president are both, in the most important possible ways for politicians, disconnected from people, especially people who they have never met. Good politicians have to spend their lives thinking about the lives of people they don't know and what they might be able to do to turn government in a direction that will help the lives of people they don't know. And that is why what happened to J.D. Vance recently when he walked into a donut shop is just so weird and interesting. J.D. Vance did that standard politician performance to show everyone what a regular guy he is. But the only thing he could think of to say 
to the people who worked there was the question of, how long have you worked here? That was it. And when they told him two years or six months, he would just say, okay. That was it. That was his entire interaction. It was widely reviewed as a failure to demonstrate that James David Vance is a regular guy. He just had no idea what to say to those working people, no idea at all. He had no curiosity about how many jobs they might be working. He had no curiosity about whether they're making the minimum wage, as is common in places like that. There is no evidence that J.D. Vance knows what the minimum wage is. And it could not have been more clear that no one in that donut shop cared who J.D. Vance is or had any curiosity about him. It just wasn't a human exchange. Donald Trump, who you know cares nothing about anyone working in a donut shop anywhere on the planet, would have done slightly better than J.D. Vance in that donut shop because he would have kept his stupid bluster flowing at least and filled up the dead air with some nonsense language. Tim Waltz is right. They're weird. Weird in the sense that they are not in any way like other people. Donald Trump and James David Vance are not anything like the voters they are appealing to. Keep that in mind now when we show you what Tim Waltz and Kamala Harris did and said today. And know that neither of the men on the Republican ticket could possibly appeal to people and identify with people the way Tim Waltz and Kamala Harris can wherever they go. We begin with Vice Presidential Candidate Tim Waltz in Boston this morning speaking to the convention of, Int of the International Association of Firefighters. I'm going to say this because I know we're bipartisan. Some of the gray hairs in here, I know what you're thinking. And I remember it too because it's my family. When Republicans used to talk about freedom, they meant it. They meant it. Not anymore. These guys over there, they want government to have the freedom to invade every corner of your life from our union halls to our kids' schools, even our doctor's office. Vice President and I, we got a little bit different vision of this. We believe that you, not politicians, should be made free to make your own health care choices. We believe that workers deserve to collectively bargain for fair wages, safe working conditions, good health care, and secure retirement. No interference from government. I learned from Tim Wald's speech to the firefighters today that the Vice President of the United States is related to a firefighter. Donald Trump is not related to anyone who has ever done work like that, fighting fires. I'm honored to be on a ticket with someone else who has long supported your essential work. As a native Californian, Vice President Harris knows explosive, dangerous, and unpredictable nature of wildfires in that state. She's been to the memorials, knows the depth of sacrifice that you and your families go through. In fact, it's a matter of family for her. The Vice President's brother-in-law, Andy Emhoff, spent his career as a firefighter in Santa Cruz, California, and retired as an IAFF member in good standing. And as The harris Waltz campaign released a new TV ad about Donald Trump's Project 2025 agenda today. The campaign is running the new ad about Project 2025 across battleground states and in the television market in Florida where Donald Trump lives so that he can see it every day between now and Election Day. Donald Trump's back and he's out for control. I would have every right to go after them. Complete control. I will wield that power very aggressively. And he has a plan to get it. Detailed plans for exactly what our movement will do. It's called Project 2025 a 922-page blueprint to make Donald Trump the most powerful president ever, overhauling the Department of Justice, giving Trump the unchecked power to seek vengeance, eliminating the Department of Education, and defunding K-12 through schools, requiring the government to monitor women's pregnancies and severe cuts to Medicare and Social Security. Donald Trump may try to deny it, but those are Donald Trump's plans. Well, revenge does take time, I will say that. And sometimes revenge can be justified. He'll take control, we'll pay the price. I'm Kamala Harris, and I approve this message.
After his speech to the firefighters in Boston today, Tim Walls met Vice President Harris in Georgia to begin a bus tour of that state, where a recent Fox poll shows Kamala Harris running ahead of Donald Trump now, 50 to 48. Vice President Harris and Governor Walz were greeted by students of Savannah State University, Georgia's oldest historically black college and university. Kamala Harris and Tim Walz then visited Liberty County High School in Hinesville, Georgia, where they listened to the school's marching band's rehearsal. Now, you're about to listen to Tim Walls talking to high school students. And just imagine J.D. Vance or Donald Trump trying to talk to high school students. When you listen to Kamala Harris talking to high school students in a moment about discipline and teamwork and great leadership, imagine J.D. Vance or Donald Trump trying to talk to high school students about, about those things. You'll hear Kamala Harris talking to a high school band, telling them about her experience being in the band in high school. The only gap between Tim Walls and Kamala Harris and those students is an age gap. It's not a humanity gap. They understand each other. Yes, there are gigantic policy differences between the presidential candidates, but you don't have to know anything about governing policy to see the giant humanity difference, the humanity gap between Donald Trump, J.D. Vance, and Kamala Harris and Tim Walls. And thank you for that. Uh, to the staff that's here, uh, my uh, my previous job to this was, of course, public school teacher and coach, uh, which I wear with pride. To all of you, thank you. Thanks for having us in your school, and uh, thanks to all the teams that are here. I think you kind of embody this idea, and the vice president talks a lot about it. Each of our individual talents, what we can contribute, um, but something bigger than ourselves when you get together. Your single instrument alone is an amazing thing. But as part of this band, it becomes really amazing. And then to see a school community, each and every one of these teams, I said I coach football a lot, but uh, all of this is part of doing something bigger. And I we wanted to come by to remind you that our nation is counting on you. We're so proud of you and everything you have achieved. And I will tell you, I was in band when I was your age. <laughs> so I know a little bit about how your coach knows about the players, right? And all that you all are doing, it requires a whole lot of rehearsal, a whole lot of practice, long hours, right? Sometimes you hit the note, sometimes you don't, right? But all that practice makes for beautiful music. And that is a metaphor, that is symbolic for everything that you all will do in your life which is you're going to show what a winning team looks like. You're going to show what it means to put yourself out on the field, to put yourself in front of people, to have the confidence to do it. Sometimes you're going to hit the step right. Sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're going to win the game. Sometimes you may not. But you know, you never let any circumstance knock you down or slow you down. You just keep going at it. That's who you are. And that's why we are so confident in everything that you are doing and will continue to do for our country. So just keep being you and all of the excellence that you're bringing to everything you do. Okay? All right. I know there are things that you are not in favor of, this ballot harvesting, this mail-in ballot. It's all terrible. It shouldn't be allowed. It's a whole different mindset. But you know? it is. Anytime you have a mail-in ballot, there's going to be massive fraud. Donald Trump is already trying to undermine the results of the upcoming presidential election. He is laying the groundwork to potentially challenge the outcome. And Democrats are preparing to fight back. Former Obama campaign manager Jim Messina will chair the newly launched Democracy Defenders Pact, which will raise money for messaging and legal action against Republican election challenges. 
The group has already attracted some well-known talent like attorney Norm Eisen, Biden-Harris campaign staffer T.J. Ducklow, and Allegra Lawrence Hardy, a close ally of former Georgia gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams. In a statement, Messina said, we are not messing around with this too much is on the line, and we have seen what Trump is capable of when he loses an election fair and square. Joining me now, Jim Messina, former Obama campaign manager and chair of the Democracy Defenders PAC. Uh, Jim, it's great to have you uh, on the show again. So let's talk about hypotheticals here. What sort of challenges do you expect Trump to bring after Election Day, and do you expect him uh, at least to try and affect the races up and down the ballot as well? Oh, I mean, yeah, absolutely. It's not even to election day. He's already starting. To your point, he's out there undermining democracy, talking about how normal ways like mail-in voting are wrong. His people are trying to pack the Georgia uh, state efforts. They're already calling questions. They're already talking about lawsuits. I mean, his campaign manager said at the Republican National Convention that it wouldn't be over on election day. It would only be over uh, on inauguration day which shows you what they're going to do. They're going to fight this thing tooth and nail. And, you know, I believe President Trump when he says he wants to be a di dictator on day one. I believe him when he says he wants to stop some of these ways that people vote all across the country. And we just decided enough is enough. We're not going to take it anymore. Jim, you um, said in a statement that we're going to be stepping up and providing resources directly to state parties and allies on the ground to make sure every American can cast their vote with confidence and without uh, interference. Tell me more about how you will be directly helping local officials fight these challenges. I mean, we, we started this program tonight talking about what is taking place in Georgia and the chaos that uh, election board members there are trying to sow already. But how do you challenge that when you see this taking place on such a local grassroots level? Yeah, it's the, it's the great question. So we're going to put $10 million immediately into the field and grants to state parties and allied organizations that, to your point, are actually on the ground uh, fighting these every day. We're going to help with messaging to talk about why these things are bad make sure everyone's talking about the same uh, hymn sheet here. And then third, we're going to make sure that everyone understands the resources that are out there, how they can fight some of this stuff, how we can go to court and get emergency stays, how we can really deal with some of these things. We need to be really fast. And the way you be fast is move money to organizations on the ground. And so that's what we're going to do. Um, are you prepared for the Democracy Defenders PAC to be actively involved in legal battles up into and potentially um, not just Election Day, but as you mentioned, all the way up to Inauguration Day? I mean, we all remember, we're old enough to remember what happened four years ago uh, on January the 6th. There's no reason to, to believe that if they lose this time, it will not be a repeat, even perhaps on a larger and worse scale, even on state levels. Oh, you're exactly right. Um, part of what Democracy Defenders, and by the way, I love the name of this new thing. It makes me feel like I'm going to be a superhero, Eamon. <laughs> like the Finally Avengers. Finally making them up. <laughs> Right, Avengers, exactly. Um, we're going to do three things. We're going to move $10 million to local and state organizations. We are going to absolutely be the, the tip of the spear on lawsuits all the way up into Inauguration Day for anyone who's trying to push back and sow uh, discord on the democracy. And then three, after Inaugural Day, we're going to continue to talk about why it's so important to do these things, why it's so important to have free and fair elections. You know, you and I kind of grew up in a world where we thought that was pretty much assumed. Apparently, we're not in that world anymore. And so we got to continue to talk to people about why things like mail-in balloting, early voting are so important to preserve our democracy. Let's talk about how you get people involved right now. I mean, obviously, you have an initial budget of $10 million. How much are you hoping to raise to really be able to, to fight back against these election challenges? I mean, I think last time we were talking about uh, maybe 60 different cases um, across the country. This time, it may be even more if uh, Donald Trump loses. How are you trying to get ordinary folks involved in this effort? Yeah, it's going to take all of us, right? It's going to take an absolute village, as Hillary Clinton said, to fight this stuff. And, and it's not just money. It's also education, the work you're doing, talking about these things, covering things like what's happening in Georgia. You know, not a lot of people are covering this stuff. And so we're going to be out there talking about these things as well uh, and highlighting stories from the ground up. I think part of this is just building a grassroots movement of people who understand what's happening and can talk about it and push back 
on it. So money's great, but really it has to be at the grassroots. And so we're going to work really closely with state parties and state organizations to make sure we can do that, Eamon. All right, Jim Messina, I'm going to congratulate you on assembling the Avengers and uh, fighting to defend our democracy. We definitely uh, need it going into the election. Jim Messina, greatly appreciate your time and insights this evening. Thank you. Thanks for having me. She became a career prosecutor while he became a career criminal. With 34 felonies, two impeachments, and one porn star to prove it, Kamala Harris has a resume. Donald Trump has a rap sheet. <laughs> she presides over the Senate while he keeps our national secrets next to his thinking chair. Texas Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett drew a strong contrast between the two people currently running for president when she addressed the Democratic National Convention last week. The freshman House member has been a prominent voice among congressional Democrats, not only for the Democratic presidential ticket, but also in the Oversight and Accountability Committee, where she has confronted Republicans over their bullying tactics and the ex-president's retention of classified documents. And joining now is Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett, Democrat of Texas, who, as of today, is a new national co-chair of the Harris-Walls campaign. Congratulations on that, Congresswoman. It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. I want to first start just to get your response to the, 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 the sound we played of J.D. Vance um, in the previous segment where he basically says he's, he's going after Randy Weingarten, and he basically says, like, if you don't have your own children, like, stay the hell away from ours. You shouldn't be, basically, you shouldn't be a teacher involved in education if you don't have your own children. And this is now a, a whole body of stuff where he really seems to have it out for folks that don't have kids. I'm just curious your reaction to that. The guy is a weirdo. Um, <laughs> it, it's really quite simple, you know, and I thought that it was a really good point that was raised about um, those sisters that teach kids like me, um, because I actually went to Catholic middle school. So I absolutely know what that's like. And so I, I am curious to know what he thinks. But we also know that they have been pushing the Project 2025 agenda. And a lot of that agenda kind of has their own definition of what Christianity looks like and, and what Christian families look like and what we all should be doing. And I don't think that that's inclusive of Catholicism and um, the Muslim um, folk as well as um, yeah. atheist folk, everybody else, even though we supposedly have this thing called freedom of religion in this country. So the harris Wall campaign, of which you are now a national uh, campaign co-chair, uh, they, are, they are in Georgia. Georgia looked... Georgia looked in rough shape. We've got some new swing state polling out today. Again, no one poll is determinative, but it shows narrowing gaps uh, and, 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 in fact, a lead uh, in some of these swing states. Uh, Harris up in Arizona, by, up by two points in Georgia, down one in North Carolina, up in Nevada. Again, all within the margin of error era. They're doing a swing through what's called the Black Belt in Georgia uh, in, 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 in areas that are both rural and predominantly African-American. I'm just curious... Your thoughts about that, which I haven't seen a candidate do in a while, I got to say. I'm very excited about it. Um, that is exactly what we're going to get out of this team. We're going to get them doing the things that are out of the box because they understand what the stakes look like. But here's the reality. We are just not having the conversations with rural America that we should be having because we do have an agenda that is actually about bettering their lives. When we look at the broadband access that's been brought to rural America, that was brought by Democrats in the House and the Senate and a Democratic administration. That means better access to health care. That means better access to jobs. That means better access to education. Um, a lot of times, as someone who lived in East Texas, I know that we are limited to whichever plant is set up in that community. And if that plant closes, then that potentially decimates all of your economic opportunities. Um, the general feeling in the race right now is a kind of consolidation of the Democratic base, uh, a campaign that's been been obviously transformed by the departure of the president and the vice president accepting the nomination. Um, what, what, what keeps you up at night? Where, like, where is your head as, as you're looking at the, the next 68, 69 days? 
Yeah, I think the only regret will be that I didn't give it my all. Everyone that I talk to, I tell them we've got to run through the tape. We can't take anything for granted. We can't look at these polls and get excited. We can't look at how many people are showing up to the rallies and get excited because ultimately the only poll that matters is the poll on election day. And so I don't want people to get comfortable. I don't want them to feel as if we have this in the bag because it's far from over. And we know that the forces that are working against us are strong and in full force. We know in states like Texas, they're trying to kick people off of the rolls. In fact, they are kicking people off the rolls. They're yep. now going in and they are perpetrating raids on elderly women that are simply just trying to do their part for democracy. Um, we are facing some really ugly and negative forces that are doing everything that they can to hold on to power. And so for me, if I laid back and as Tim Wall says, goes to sleep, he says we can sleep when we dead. I tell people I'm the walking dead right now because I'm not getting sleep, but it's just that important. Um, we reported on the, uh, the beginning of the show about the um, altercation that happened in Arlington National Cemetery where uh, the ex-president brought a campaign videographer, uh, turned his appearance there into a, a, a campaign spot that was uploaded on their social media feeds. A, a worker there, a, a, apparently, again, this is the best we can sort of get from the reporting from NPR and our own reporting and what we've heard, uh, tried to stop them. Uh, they plowed through that. Um, they're, they're kind of doubling down on it, and they're saying that the, the worker at Arlington National Cemetery was uh, having a mental, uh, like a mental health issue and, and, and sort of attacking that person. I'm curious your reaction on that. I mean, it's the same old games with these guys, you know? Like, they don't abide by norms. They don't abide by the law. And honestly, anyone that tries to enforce any rules upon them, they literally just steamroll them, and they act as yep. if they were all— Right. Um, it's really unfortunate, especially when you have someone that is running to be the most powerful person in the world, to know that they literally just have no appreciation for basic norms. This is not the party of law and order. Um, I think that we know that. That may have been who the Republicans used to be, but MAGA definitely is not that. If you listen to most Republicans across the country right now, they desperately want Donald Trump to focus on the issues, like the economy or even the border. But if you look at Trump's social media, he is clearly not listening. Today, he shared a flood of content full of QAnon references, calls for jailing lawmakers and the special counsel investigating him, and a sexually crude comment that was quite inappropriate about Vice President Harris. Meanwhile, the former president is facing major controversy over a visit to Arlington National Cemetery that happened earlier this week. Here's Garrett Hake with more. Tonight, the Trump campaign is defending the candidate's Monday visit to Arlington National Cemetery, now being criticized for politicizing America's war dead on hallowed ground. What a horrible day it was. The campaign on Tuesday posting this TikTok highlight video of Trump's trip, showing him laying a wreath in honor of the service members killed at Abbey Gate in Afghanistan and posing with family members among the gravestones. Several campaign staff posting their own content, too. It's disrespectful. It's not Disney World. It's Arlington National Cemetery, and it should be respected as such. The visit first drawing scrutiny after reported altercation between campaign and cemetery staff over photography. The Trump campaign saying a staffer, quote, decided to physically block members of President Trump's team during a very solemn ceremony. A cemetery spokesperson writing, federal law prohibits political campaign or election-related activities within Army National Military Cemeteries. Arlington National Cemetery reinforced and widely shared this law and its prohibitions with all participants. The Harris campaign calling it all a sad episode, saying Trump has a, quote, history of demeaning and degrading military service members. The vice president herself has not commented on the incident. Trump running mate J.D. Vance responding late today. She wants to yell at Donald Trump because he showed up. She can, she can go to hell. <laughs> Kelly Barnett invited the former president to Arlington. Her son, Marine Staff Sergeant Taylor Hoover, died at Abbey Gate. What would you say to people who may be pro-Trump, anti-Trump, whatever their politics might be, who just feel like that's not a place for politicians or for politics? Um, I would have to say, if, are you in my shoes? Um, I invited him. Um, my son was, was murdered under the Biden-Harris administration. Utah Governor Spencer Cox attending with Trump posting these photos. He later apologized for using them in a fundraising email. 
And tonight, the New York Times reports it got a statement from the family of a Green Beret, Sergeant Andrew Marquinsano, who is buried in the same section of the cemetery where one of the photos was taken. They say they did not give their permission. Joining me now, Basil Schmeichel, Democratic strategist and former executive director of the New York State Democratic Party. He is now an MSNBC political analyst and Columbia University professor. And Susan Del Percio, a veteran Republican strategist, as well as an MSNBC political analyst. Thank you both for being here. You know, Susan, the soldiers that are laid to rest at Arlington National Cemetery, they did not fight for a political party. They did not fight um, for an allegiance to a particular president. They, they fought for all of us. And when I saw this unfold and all everything that's happened in the aftermath, to me, it just, it, it feels like this is just another example of our norms eroding right in front of us, doesn't it? It's an example of Donald Trump's flatant disregard and, and I think sometimes hatred of our country for not understanding how people could fight and protect our country, and that has zero respect for them, Simone. How he could possibly, dis and the campaign think they could get away with disregarding the rules of Arlington Cemetery is, is a slap in the face to every American, not just those who have our Gold Star family members, but especially to those who are, in fact, I mean, it highlights them and their service. And as the reporting shows tonight, there are members who are upset that they, their family members were used in this way. Um, again, showing a sacred location of the cemetery being used for political purposes. Only someone like Donald Trump, who has no respect for the military, could possibly do this. You know, the family of um, the Green Beret, Sergeant Marcusano, uh, th they they just, they said no one asked their permission. And I think that's a very important point that the this is not just uh, the people's families are buried here, heroes, people who, who lost their lives in service of our country. And Basil, that is what the Arlington officials um, reiterated. They said that any campaign-related activities inside are against federal law, period, whether you're a Democrat or Republican or whomever. Now, Republicans say um, that they are the law and order party, yet this campaign just can't seem to follow a pretty basic federal law. And it just feels like they're inviting more issues when it, as it relates to um, service members and veterans. What is really going on here? Well, you know, Simone, you and Susan, I have worked for elected officials. And just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you should do a thing. Um, and that is really what the Donald Trump campaign and his circle of friends and supporters, that seems to be their, their MO. It doesn't matter if we can do it or, or we should do it. If we can do it, just, just do it. Um, and deal with the repercussions later. And in fact, let's not deal with the repercussions later. Let's just fundraise off of it. Um, and the only reason that he would even pause for a moment to consider the ramifications of what he does is if it somehow chips away at his fame. You know, so I, I agree with everything that Susan said, that this has never been about respect for the military because he's diminished and talked ill of the military and the generals. If you remember going back to 2016, this is really just about a campaign stop. Um, and look, I, for whatever the reason, whatever reason the family said, I want you to visit the grave, that's fine. But any one of us would have probably said, yeah, I'll do that, but I'm not going to take pictures there. I'm not going to take video there. I'm certainly not going to let an ally of mine use it as a fundraising tool. Mm -hmm. um, and then you go mm -hmm. off and do something else. But, but, you know, there are no boundaries. And that is, that is where we are in this country with Donald Trump. No boundaries, no rules. We do it because we can. And um, imagine how that impacts other policies going forward. I mean, truly, there is a way to have honored the Gold Star Mother's request while also honoring the law and the other families sure. who um, have loved ones buried at Arlington National Cemetery. This is not happening in a vacuum, though. This comes just after mm -hmm. Donald Trump took a, a lot of backlash for his comments about Medal of Honor recipients. Uh, Susan, my question is about voters. How are voters going to react to yet another headline showing Donald Trump in this light when it comes to our men and women in uniform? Well, it goes back to your first question, Simone, is to are we a little all too numb to Donald Trump's mm. antics? And I think when we hear 
what happened today, we all may have a view through a patriotic viewpoint or even a political viewpoint. But the fact is, is that the voters hear this. They know that this is what Donald Trump is like. I don't think he wins votes or loses votes. It just reaffirms whatever you think about Donald Trump. But it does open the door for the Harris Walls team to, to step in and talk about how things should be done properly, hmm. how we've had enough of this man degrading our, our service members. I mean, it started off with him talking about John McCain saying he doesn't like people who get hmm. captured. I mean, it, it's gone downhill since then. And that's why I think when you look at the, wall, the, the Harris Walls campaign and how they choose to respond delicately, not they don't go over the top like Donald Trump, but they make their point known and it shows the public, yeah, we should be done with this guy. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and to the to Garrett's point in the package, Vice President Harris has yet to weigh in on this. I will bet my bottom dollar she will be asked in this interview that she is going to do tomorrow. Uh, I want to switch gears to talk about Donald Trump's social media feed. QAnon, threats crude comments um, and inappropriate comments about Vice President Harris and Secretary Clinton, frankly. Do you think that his campaign team, Basil, is is desperately trying to hide his phone right now? I just, uh, the, the posts are not helping him with voters in Michigan or Pennsylvania, but also he, the man wants to be president of the United States of America. Like, do, is how can anyone think this is appropriate? Well, most of us don't think it's appropriate. I'd say the vast majority of the country doesn't think it's appropriate, but he does, and he thinks he can rally his base by posting these things and, and mm -hmm. explain it away, even if he chooses not to, that his base will still be there and behind him. And and actually, you know, this relates to the, to your question to Susan, because there are often times when I think, are we so inured in our country, desensitized in our country, that these things don't matter to a lot of voters, that you know, gun violence just kind of rolls uh, rolls off uh, rolls off our back. It, you know, where before it was weeks or uh, day, certainly days and weeks of coverage, but now we are so desensitized and work to all of this mess. But what the Harris Walls campaign has proved with the enthusiasm is that no campaigns can be restorative. They can actually bring back the kind of uh, feelings and values and understanding of what normalcy really is. In, in our in our governance. And so when you look at the kinds of things that Donald Trump is tweeting, that's why the Tim Walt's comment about it being weird, about him being weird, really hits home because it's like, we don't do that. That, that That's something that we shouldn't take for granted. It's something that we shouldn't become accustomed to. And you know, that's, again, that's I think why you saw the kind of enthusiasm over the last month that we have.